Good morning, City Life. Good morning, church. Good morning, visitors. Good morning, anyone who's watching this. I'm so grateful to be together on this Easter Sunday. I never thought that I would be in my career as a pastor, be preaching from my kitchen, but here we are. Welcome to our City Life Corporate Kitchen headquarters. If you haven't noticed, we have a lot of headquarters all over Jersey City. Um, really quick, I am just so ecstatic with the news um, about the permanent lead pastoral. It is my honor. It is um, a joy in my life to be your pastor, and I plan on being your pastor as best as I can and as fully as I can. And let's go together. Let's go forward together and passionately for Jesus in our city. So grateful. Um, we'll talk about that more at some other time, but today, this is Easter Sunday. Today is the holy weekend that we have. Today is all of the bad sports metaphor of the Super Bowl, the World Cup, the World Series, all of it put together. This is our weekend where we just thank Jesus for what he's doing. We thank him that he is the Savior, that he proved to us that he's sitting at the right hand of the Father right now. We thank Jesus for his life, for his death, and his resurrection today. He is risen. He is risen indeed, that's right. And so, um, so grateful to get the word out, our Easter word out today. We're going to be ending like we do every week in our MC calls. And so let's celebrate on those calls together. Let's celebrate this week on those prayer meetings that we have over Zoom. This week, man, thank Jesus that he went on the cross, but that his story didn't end there, but that he is risen. Um, and so this is my first Easter sermon ever. It is such a privilege. It is such an honor. My struggle this week has been, I want to say everything that I possibly can. And so I think this sermon today is a little bit, it's really big, um, but it's everything that I've, it's a lot of what I've wanted to always say about Jesus and Easter and what his death and resurrections means to us. And so we have to begin by saying that Easter week, Easter Sunday is a lot like the first three Indiana Jones movies. Not the fourth, because there is nothing good or redeemable about the fourth one, but the first three Indiana Jones movies. That we get to see this story that the Gospels paint, these pictures of Jesus' story. And it's not just the story, but it's his life. It's these eyewitness accounts of what Jesus did in this world. And we find out that it's not just about getting to the treasure like in Indiana Jones. So what if you just get to the treasure? If all the Indiana Jones movies ended when he found the treasure of the ruin or the Nazis, then the story wouldn't have been as good. But a lot of the story and a lot of every story is where the story ends. Now today, very clearly, let me say that Jesus' story has not ended, that he is risen, that he is alive, and that he'll never taste death again. But Jesus lived his life and he died on purpose. And the, his, the Gospels end when he leaves, and then the sto God's story continues. But what is God telling us about the end of Jesus' story, of his life? How did he mold it? How did he put all of these beautiful pictures together? How did the arc of God's redemptive work culminate in the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus? What does the end tell us about what's to come? Now, this isn't something I share very often, but I used to be really kind of uh, obsessed with reading and watching stories about people who cl climbed Mount Everest. It was this fascination that I had, and I, for a long time, for a couple of years, I just read so much, and I just always, anytime something about Everest came up, I would read it. And when you do that, you learn that more climbers die on the way down the mountain than they, than they do on the way up. You see, the way stories end are so important. A lot of times in life and a lot of times in our relationships, uh, how things end is significant and sometimes more significant than how things began and the middle time. You know, how you end your job or how your uh, relationship ends will usually be the way that you're remembered or you remember someone. And so what does Jesus, the end of Jesus' life tell us? Now also thinking back on my life in mission year, 
when you're about three halfway three quarters of the way done with the year in mission year the thing that i did in chicago our leaders all start, started telling us how are you going to end think about how you're going to end run to the finish line don't don't limp to the finish line because in life sometimes the ending is the most important part sometimes the ending is what you're going to be remembered by and you can ruin all the good work that you've done all throughout if you botch the ending if you just mess up the ending if you don't take care of the ending of your story and so easter is the story of god's audacity to win on the cross to win through death and resurrection and today we need to talk about this victory colossians 2:15 talks about how jesus disarmed the powers and authorities he made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them by the cross none of us would have ever written god's story through triumphing through public spectacle of dying on the cross and then resurrecting and so let's read luke 24 this whole easter last week and this year week we've been in luke luke's account we're taking a break from mark i know some of you are pretty pleased by that and so let's read luke what luke has to say about jesus's resurrection in chapter 24 starting in verse 1 god's word says but on the day but on the first day of the week at early dawn they went to the tomb taking the spices they had prepared and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb but when they did not find the body of the lord jesus while they were perplexed about this behold two men stood by them in dazzling apparel and as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground the men said to them why do you seek the living among the dead he is not here but he has risen remember how he told you while he was still in galilee that the son of man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise and they remembered his words and returning from the tomb they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest now was mary magdalene and joanna and mary the mother of james and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles but these words seemed to them as idle tale and they did not believe them but peter rose and ran to the tomb stooping and looking and he saw linen cloths by themselves and he went home marveling at what had happened Let's pray so that we enter into this word uh, together in one spirit and let the, whole, the spirit of God minister to each one of us about what the Resurrection Sunday means for all of our lives, for this God's story from Jesus and beyond until he comes back. And so let's pray that God ministers to all of us exactly where we are in this season. And so, Jesus, I thank you for this day. I thank you that though we are not together, we are still victorious. We still are in you. Jesus, I pray for all of my brothers and sisters listening to this who know you and who have put you on, Lord. We thank you that we we live in your freedom. Jesus, I pray for those who are listening to this who are unsure about where they stand with you, Lord. Let your powerful resurrection story breathe new life, open eyes, redeem souls, Lord. And for anyone who stumbles upon this who might not know anything about Jesus, Lord, Holy Spirit, I pray that your kindness will draw us to repentance. Lord, we love you and we need you on this Easter Sunday. We get to worship you and it's our privilege. And so, Jesus, thank you. I pray that you be with us. In Jesus' name, amen. So here we are we let's summarize the story a little bit there is so much in here that we cannot cover everything we just cannot cover everything that goes into easter sunday in one 40 minute sermon uh maybe if we stay here for two hours two three hours we might be able to cover some a little bit more but here's the whole story that jesus came down that he condescended is what we use that coming down from heaven to earth is a condescending act from god and he took on our form and he lived with us and he took on a body and he took our likeness he became a man he lived and he ministered and everywhere he went god's kingdom came a little closer 
and then he was betrayed and captured. This man was tortured, and he was put on a hill to die, that he died on a tree, that he died the way a criminal deserved to die, the way that all of us deserve to die. And then for three days, he remained in the grave. For three days, death had a hold of him. But then on that third day, he came back, that he was risen, that death that could no longer hold him down. And then he appears over the series of these really funny and weird interactions. He appeared to his disciples. Each gospel paints it a little differently. Sometimes he's like, seems like he's a ghost popping in and out. Sometimes he's eating. Sometimes he's just hanging out. Sometimes he's just chilling with some of his disciples. But that he eats with them, that he touches them, that they touch him. He invites them to touch his wounds, to see that his body was risen, to see the death that had no claim on him. And this is a crazy story. Like, I heard a pastor talk about this this weekend, that we should be more sympathetic towards our friends who are not believers. Because the resurrection, the life and the death of resurrection is utter foolishness to us. It makes no sense how God would do this, how he could even do this, how God in the first place could come and become a man, this man and this God all together, perfectly together, and that he would come and he would die and that he would resurrect himself. Our story opens the eyes, opens the heart of everyone but let's be more sympathetic with our friends who don't believe because we have a crazy story. It's true, but God in his brilliance gave us a story that for the world is just confounding. It's foolishness. Paul talks about that. But let's talk about three things that make the resurrection matter so much to us. Let's talk about how the death and resurrection of Jesus, how the cross and the resurrection come together to mean three beautiful things for you and for me in our life today and our promises for the future. Today is a day of hope, and so we talk a lot about the promise and the hope of our future. And the first thing we have to talk about today is why the resurrection matters. The reason why we need to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ this Sunday is because the resurrection changed all of creation, changed all of history. It makes sense of everything. That together, Jesus' life, death, and resurrection come together to make sense of everything. You know, we need to talk and we need to realize, I pray that every Easter Sunday in your life is this going deeper, deeper, is that this truth permeates your heart and your soul even more and more, that it finds new grounds and that this actually happened, that this isn't a fable, that this isn't something that's ideological. You know, the resurrection, that Jesus came, he lived, he died, and then he came back to life never to die again, changes everything. You know, the resurrection is not just an ideal. It's not just like a worldview. It's not all this like force or spirit, or it's not the universe making things right again. But that it was this one man who came and who lived, who gave his life, and somehow, in God's work, that death atoned for everything. You know, we need to talk about three things about what this actual death resurrection did for the world. Later on in our passage here, it talks about how the resurrection was a bodily thing. That this was a real man who came and he came back in his body. He Later on in Luke 24, he says to his disciples, Touch me, feel my skin, feel my wounds, see that I'm really here, touch them. If you need to believe, touch me. And then he also asked them for, for food. He says, I'm hungry, and they gave him broiled fish. And Jesus goes on to talk to other people, and he teaches even a couple, like a bunch of people, a multitude of people. He teaches them, and he sends them out, and then he physically ascends up to heaven after this, after promising a uh, counselor to them. Wait in Jerusalem and a, and a counselor will come. And so the first thing we need to talk about is that this was a bodily resurrection. And that changes everything. That adds such a layer of truth to the resurrection that we cannot take for granted. You know, the fact that Jesus came back in a body, that he came back and ate, that he shared, that he hung out with his disciples, tells us that when the full resurrection comes, when Jesus comes back, that all of creation will be made clean. 
that you will get a new body, a resurrected body, that I will get a resurrected body, that all of creation will be clean, that all of creation will be restored, that we will look like Eden was supposed to look like. You know, how powerful is that resurrection message for us today? That there will be no more disease, that there will be no more COVID-19, there will be no death when Jesus comes back and when his reign finishes. What a promise that, resurrect, that Resurrection Sunday, that Easter Sunday gives to the entire world, that all of this will be made clean. You know, the second thing about Jesus' resurrection that we need to talk about here is that it is his victory, that we should never look at the cross and think that it was where Jesus ultimately lost, because Jesus ultimately, that was where he triumphed. We talked about Colossians 2 already, about how he made a public spectacle of his enemies, how he defeated Satan in the kingdom of darkness and any force that opposes Jesus while the sun is coming in really nice now. But we also need to talk about Colossians 1, starting in verse 15, that Jesus is the image of the invisible God, that he is preeminent, that all things were made by him and for him, and that in him all things come together, and that God considered it a a fullness of him was pleased to dwell in Jesus Christ. That Jesus was the rescue plan for all of creation, for you and for me, for all of this. Everything makes sense, which brings us to the third point about why the resurrection matters. is because Jesus' life, his death, and his resurrection make sense of all of Scripture, of all of God's plan. You know, later on in this chapter here in Luke 24, it says that he goes... And he starts from Adam, from Moses to the prophets, and he tells of all the things concerning him. I am an Old Testament person myself. I, you know, I love the Hebrew. I love, the, and I used to cringe at when people say it's all about Jesus because the Old Testament stands for itself as well. But all of God's plan was leading and culminating in this life. That His redemptive plan was in Jesus, and that ever. Even before Moses even knew a single word about God, creation was headed towards the cross. And that is such a beautiful thing. We talked a couple of weeks ago about how, and even last week, about how do we hold all these contrasting views, like Jesus as being the lion and the lamb, as God being victorious while he's suffering and dying. And it's because everything finds its place in the death and resurrection of Jesus that everything makes sense, all of theology (laughs) lies in there, all of our hopes, all of our promises, the fact that we get to have a day tomorrow and that our future is assured, it all hinges on the cross. It all hinges on Jesus' power to be resurrected, to never die again. I I love how, how sure our promise is in all of that, that all of life makes sense that all of our suffering will be redeemed because Jesus is able to come back from the death. And if he can do that, then nothing is safe outside of his redemptive view. Thank you, Jesus, for being our resurrected king, our coming king, that we await your return. We await for it. And in Jesus, let's talk about our second point here. We want to talk about how in Jesus there is equality for all people. We see that the women go to do their duties and take care of their Lord's body. I love how here they're already addressing Jesus as the Lord Jesus. That even from an early time when he was dead, that there was already something special about Jesus. There was already an understanding about who this man was. And they go and they're going to go do their duties to his body out of love to take care of his body, to give him the burial that he deserves. And women are the first one entrusted with Jesus' story. I hope and I pray that you've heard a lot of sermons about how countercultural that was. How in Jesus' day, no story, no gospel, no good thing, no important thing, nothing that was supposed to be publicly shared was ever given to women first. And it's this idea that in Jesus, there is equality for all people. I love how in God's whole redemptive story, is there's this arc of God constantly using the forgotten and the downtrodden, the people who are not supposed to be used, and how often the people who were supposed to be used 
and we're supposed to be the good ones, we're often people messing up the most. You know, in Mark, one of the beautiful things is that this story culminates and at the cross, the first person to ever say that Jesus is Lord after his death was a Roman centurion. That is the last person who should be confessing that Jesus is the Lord. I love how Jesus took this group of uneducated men uh, who some had the lowliest or worst of jobs or the most hated of jobs and how we see that they were uneducated and constantly being foolish and constantly not getting it and somehow this these group of men changed the entire world forever that in the fact that out of their work and out of the empowerment of the Holy Spirit that in just two generations even the Roman Empire would bend its knee to Christianity is incredible Let's talk about how God chose Paul, a murderer. He chose him to spread his church around the world. God uses anyone that he wants, and often he uses the last person that we think. Every Over and over and over again, people in God's redemptive story, even David, David the runt of his family, the short one, as some of his books call him, the red-headed child, um, and yet God chooses him over Saul, who looked like a king. God's story over and over and over again is picking the person who is least expected. And so let's read Galatians really quick. Galatians is this powerful story, is this powerful uh, picture here of what Jesus was doing. Paul had time to process. He met Jesus face to face when he was on the road to Damascus. And he, Jesus radically changed his life from being a murderer, from being a zealot, to being this humble servant. And Paul says this in Galatians 3.23. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we may be justified by faith, but now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male and female. For you are all in one, you are all one in Christ Jesus. And in you are Christ's, and if you are in Christ, excuse me, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. That in Christ, that in the resurrection, that when we, as Galatians says, when we put on Christ, when we call him Lord, when we call him Savior, and say that we live for him, that there is nothing that divides us, there is nothing that makes anyone more righteous than the other because it's all about Christ. That Jesus is resurrection, that we get to step into Jesus, that we get to step behind him as our Lord and Savior and say that there is nothing that separates you and for me. And what does that mean for our lives as followers of Christ who want to go after Jesus passionately? You know, Jesus here is saying that you will never be forgotten. That Jesus constantly in his story, in his narrative, in his redemptive arc, was picking up all the people who were forgotten. And he says, you will not be forgotten, but you will be in my story. I can use you. And so this gives us freedom once again to be broken people with one another. This is what gives us the freedom to be the church with one another, to live our lives together, side by side, arm in arm, and to love Jesus and to love one another because you are never going to be perfect and I am never going to be perfect. But in Christ, we are one and we are heirs and we are in the same body as Christ. And so if we have this freedom to be broken, I want to share early our prompt for today. There's only one prompt and the prompt is what brokenness are we leaving behind in this quarantine season? You know, we belong to Christ, and Christ is doing a mighty work around the world right now. I know it, even though it's hard to see. And so what brokenness in your life are you leaving behind right now? That is going to become one of the most important questions for the church. 
for us as a corporate body and for us, us as individuals. What are we leaving this behind in this quarantine season and we are not taking with us in our lives anymore? And so naturally, when we talk about this brokenness, we have to talk about our last point of the day. We have to talk about God's good promises. And so let's talk about some linen. So in the promise of Jesus' linen, we have a promise that is an eternal process. It's a promise, a beautiful promise that has so much implications for our daily lives. It is incredible and we barely even know where to look for it. In our Luke passage in verse 12, it says, But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stopping and looking in. He saw linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. Okay, little weird. Luke, what are you trying to say? That enough for us, for us modern people who don't know the culture, that is not enough. But thankfully, that is not for us to know what to do with that. But thankfully, in John's account of this, he goes into more detail. And so go with me to John chapter 20, verse 6 and 7. God's word says, Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen, linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Oof. Still, not enough, but God, this is a promise that you should hold on to every day. Remind yourself about the promise of Jesus' cl face cloth, because it is one of the most beautiful things in all of Scripture. You know, Scripture is, God's redemptive, is a picture of God's redemptive story of how he was coming to rescue us. Every night, Anna and I read to Ryan uh, a kid's Bible about God's redemptive story. And this is one of the more beautiful pictures, one of the more beautiful embodiments of God's promise to you and to me. See, in Jesus' day and in their culture, when they were eating at the table together, if you needed to leave the table for some, for whatever reason, you would just get your nap in your face cloth and you would put it next to your food or next to your plate or, or next to where you were sitting. And that was a sign of saying that you were done, that you were done, you're not coming back, that the servants can come and take your food away. But if, if someone were to fold their napkin, fold their face cloth, and put it next to their food, that meant to everyone, I'm coming back. I don't take my food away. I'm still enjoying it. I just had to leave. I'm coming back for this. And the fact that we see here in John's Gospel that Jesus folded up his face cloth, even in this little detail, God is so perfectly telling his story for you and for me, that he is coming back for us, that he will never leave us or forsake us. <laughs> I love that. We need that promise on Resurrection Sunday. You know, there is a side of all of this story that is not just about Jesus' life, not just about what he did or that his resurrection, but that his life and resurrection also points to the future, that God is promising things about our future that if we just hold on to him, especially in difficult times, if we hold on to him and if we stay true, and if we let him purify us, a couple weeks ago we talked about his fire and how it produces good things, and if we let that take hold in our heart, then here Jesus is promising us four things about our future, four beautiful things that the pastor Tim Keller points out in one of his books. The first thing that Jesus is promising to you and to me about our future is that it's there. You know, that nothing will separate you from the plans that God has for you. That if you are in Christ, that nothing, not even death, can separate you from what God is doing in your life. And so your future is there. You have one. A lot of people try and say, oh, that this life is all that there is. And when you die, you go somewhere. But that is not the truth. That is not the truth that we get out of Scripture. You have a promise. It's there. The second thing is that it's personal. You know, it's, it's not this idea of the universe working itself out, that when you die, you go and you join this force and you're in harmony or there's just nothingness. But no, that's not true. We have a personal future. That Jesus came back and, and spent time that he ate, that he hung out with his disciples, that he continued to teach them. 
it shows us that we are going to live a life with our Creator. That when in His wisdom the end comes, that we will be living with Him. And so your future with Jesus is there, and it's personal, and it's also certain. Jesus' life, His death, and His resurrection tell us that it is certain. Uh, Tim Keller says it this way, that uh, the cross and His resurrection are like the receipt that nothing's going to keep you away from the life and the future that Jesus has for you, that it is certain that there's nothing that's going to get in the way, that, just, that Jesus even defeated death, our last enemy, our greatest enemy, nothing will separate you. So your future is there, it's certain, it's personal, and it is also unimaginably wonderful. We read in one of our prayer calls this week that Jesus went through the cross, that he bared the cross because of the surpassing joy that was in front of him. That this future, that this promise for our future is so much more hopeful, it's so much better than any of the alternative, than any of the other religions, than any of these secular ideas that we can have about returning to nothingness. That we were made with this appetite to crave good things that only God can do. He's the only author and perfecter of our faith. He's the only one who gives us good gifts. And so that our future with Him will be unimaginably wonderful. That we'll eat great food with Him. That we will hang out with Him. That we will serve Him. And it won't just be the pictures of heaven that we see all the time of us worshiping. Because that even that is going to be wonderful. But that we are going to live a life that we're going to have a body, that all of these wonderful things are coming together, and that life with Jesus is going to be so much better than we ever imagined. You know, that is the hope. All of these come together and give us the hope of our future, that God has good plans for you and for me, that nothing stands in the way, that Jesus took care of all of it on the cross and in his resurrection. And so we need to wrap up somewhere. We need to put all of these ideas together. And so in conclusion, life only makes sense with Jesus. We say that all the time, but today, Easter Sunday, is such a picture of all of that. That even scripture, all of scripture, points to Jesus. That all of history points to Jesus. That all of our appetites, that all of our soul's cravings point to what we find in Jesus. That Jesus' death on a tree brought back to creation the tree of life. We, we can spend the rest of our lives talking about that. We can spend the rest of our lives and all of eternity thanking Jesus that his tree of life came back to us. Man, scripture and life only make sense when we know our Savior Jesus. All the paradoxes of life, all the complexities, all of the things that we cannot make sense of this quarantine season, COVID, all of these questions only make sense with Jesus. And it might take a while for us to get the answers. Some of the questions we have will take a second past eternity for us to understand. But that life with Jesus is certain, that we have a future, that it is taken care of, that it is secure, that it will be so much better, that it will be personal, all of these things or Jesus just showering his love over all of creation, over all of us. And it is just more than we can take. That we will spend the rest of our lives on Easter Sundays and hopefully every Sunday trying to capture the goodness and the fullness of Jesus is just incredible. You know, this last thing about the resurrection is that life takes so much from us, that there is pain and that there is suffering. And the only one who can restore and the only one who can come back to life and breathe life back into what we've lost to redeem all the pain and the suffering is the one who defeated death itself and who defeated our enemy. And that man is Jesus. That God man is Jesus Christ. And so right now we're going to let's go to our MC calls. And let's spend a vulnerable, intimate time in these smaller communities taking communion together. Communion is this act where we remember what Jesus did. We remember the body that was broken on our behalf. 
we remember that his blood that represents the new covenant for you and for me that we get to live in that gives us all of these assurances and all of these beautiful promises about where our lives are going. Let's spend this intimate time in smaller groups remembering and talking about what Jesus has done for you. And then after communion, let's talk about this one prompt that we have for the week. And the question is just simply, what new thing has quarantine taught you about Jesus' death and resurrection? I'll say it again. What new thing has quarantine taught you about Jesus' death and resurrection? Every week I come here and I read the, my prompt questions, and they don't always make sense, but I hope, you get, I hope you get the idea. What in this quarantine season do you know God's death and resurrection is giving you power to leave behind? You know, just like Israel went into exile and came back and they no longer worshipped idols, what are you going to leave behind in this season of life? Let's not waste this suffering. Let's not waste not being able to live our lives the way we want to. Let's not waste this time. We pray for everyone who's suffering. We pray for all of our doctors and frontline workers and nurses and social workers and everyone trying to impact and do their jobs well. We pray for all of you. Let's leave behind as a church. Let's leave behind as individuals because of the power and the promise and the love that we get from Resurrection Sunday. Easter Sunday. Let's leave some stuff behind so that we leave COVID-19 saying that we are healthier and stronger people. Church, I love you. We love you. We want to be here. We are a faith community together and we're living out this promise together. We are going after this future with all of you. And so let's remain connected. Let's remain thankful and loving and let gratitude overwhelm us for what Jesus did for us both on the cross and in his resurrection. Happy Easter. He is risen. Love you. Have a great day.